All right, it is Wednesday, June the 3rd. Oops, that's not what I want to do. Wednesday, June the 3rd, and today we're going to continue on with Act 4. But before we do anything else, step one, I'm going to remind everybody about one-on-one -on -one conferencing schedules. And there's really only two and a half weeks time left to meet with me to make sure what you're doing is accurate and etc. that sort of thing. Um, I'm also going to remind everybody of Merck Pride Week. We had a great time yesterday with the Kahoot. Over 40 people showed up, which was wonderful. <laughs> Today we're asking people to make posters and take a picture of the poster. And um, what we're going to do if somebody takes a selfie, um, which is what we put on the poster, is we'll only, we'll crop just the, the poster itself. Um, student privacy is really important. And not just because this is a safe zone GSA thing. Um, in order to post a student's face, we need, there's a FOIP thing where you have to, your parents have to sign and <laughs> Too much work so when you send in a poster i will crop the poster itself and that'll be on our big um powerpoint and then tomorrow night from six till eight is an online hangout and it's going to be a netflix party where the group will be watching the movie a secret love which is about two canadian women who came out in their 80s and they um actually one of the ladies was on a softball team and she, her life, her baseball team or softball team inspired the movie A League of Their Own. Alrighty, so now we're going to go into classwork and open up our Henry V Act 4. Today we're going to get through at least scenes two and three. I assigned all five questions for the prologue, but then with scene two I only assigned question number six because it was quite an excessive question and I thought of all the questions, that was probably the most important. And now we're going to move on to scene three. When my computer decides to finally finish downloading the whole document. They're very big documents because I decided to include the script inside the document to make the online teaching more effective and to provide the text with notes, which our particular textbook does not come with, which, um, which is why I only ever taught it once in the past, I think. But now that I've got all these notes that I've been creating, I will definitely teach it again. All right, come on, you. There's scene one. At this rate, we won't even get through scene two. There we go. Slowly but surely. This is probably one of the most famous scenes of Shakespeare, in which, in particular, that unit where the king goes around the camp and talks to all the men, including the um, foot soldiers, so that uh, he can help build up the spirits of all the men.
Oh, here we go. Nope. Nope, not yet. I saw Flewellen and the uh, leak, but that's still seeing one. I am so sorry for the misery of my document, but it's one of the things we endure in order for me to be able to give you guys proper notes. really makes me wish I was an extraordinarily wealthy person. Well, not really. There's the pranky place. There we go. Now we're moving at a proper pace. This is this huge soliloquy. And here we are, finally. So I only have one question for scene two. What is the overall tone of the scene? What is the mood of the French army? Judiciously select their most outrageous boast. So I said mood, but tone. Tone and mood are similar. Mood is strongly emotional. Tone is and can be more attitude. It can also have elements of emotion because you can feel disgust so it can be a tone of disgust you know you could have a sense of disgust towards someone but the key difference between mood and tone is mood is how do they feel what is the feel what is their attitude so we're looking for the overall attitude French camp enter the Dauphin Orleans Grandbills and others. The sun doth gild our armor. Up, my lords. Monte a cheval, my horse, Violet, lackey, ha. Oh, brave spirit. Via les, via les eaux et la terre, rien puis l'air est fou. Ciel, cousin Orleans. Now, my lord constable. How ha hark how our steeds for present service nay, mount them and make incision in their hides, that their hot blood may spin in English eyes and doubt them with superfluous courage. Ha! What, will you have them weep our horse's blood? How shall we then behold their natural tears? The English are embattled, you French peers. To horse, you gallant princes, straight to horse. Do not do but behold yon poor and starved band, and your fair show shall suck away their souls, leaving them but shales and husks of men. There is not work enough for all our hands, scarce blood enough in all their sickly veins to give each naked curtail axe a stain, that our French gallants today shall draw out and sheathe for lack of sport. Let us but blow on them. The vapor of our valor will o'erturn them. Tis positive against all exceptions, lords, that our superfluous lackeys and our peasants, who in unnecessary action swarm about our squares of battles, were enough to purge this field of such a hideling foe. Though we upon this mountain's ba basis by... This mountain's base... Should be base. By took stand for idle speculation, but that honors must not. What's to say? A very little let us do, and all is done. 
then let the trumpet sound, the tucket sonus, and the note to mount, for our approach shall so much dare the field that England shall couch down in fear and yield. Enter Grand Pre. Why do you stay so long, my friend, lords of France? Yond island carriers, desperate of their bones, ill-favoredly become the morning field. Their ragged curtains poorly are let loose, and our air shakes them passing scornfully. Big Mars seems bankrupt in their beggared host, and faintly through a rusty beaver peeps, the horsemen sit like fixed candlesticks with torch which with torch staves in their hands, and their poor jades lob down their heads, dropping the hides and hips, the gum drope down roping from their pale dead eyes, and in their pale dull mows the gemmeled bit lies foul with chawed grass still and motionless, and their executors, the knavish crows, fly o'er them all, impatient for their hour, Description cannot suit itself in words to demonstrate the life of such a battle in life so lifeless as it shows itself. They have said their prayers and they stay for death. Shall we go send them dinners and fresh suits and give their fasting horses provender and after fight with them? I stay but for my guard. On to the field. On to the field. I will the banner from a trumpet take and use it for my haste. Come, come away. The sun is high, and we outwear the day. Exit. Alrighty. So tone. What is their attitude? What is their attitude? toward the British. Another two coffee day. So go through your scene and think about what is their attitude, what is the tone. And since we're looking at attitude, their attitude towards the battle, their attitude towards the British. comes out best in the words that the constable says here, lines 15 to 37. And Grand Pré in his lines um, 39 to 55. You get your strongest sense of attitude towards the battle, towards the British. Now, this isn't much different from previous scenes. They are continuing on with this foolish belief. That, if you can hear it, is the sound of coffee beans being ground. For my second cup of coffee. Yay!
while you guys are thinking, I'll reread these lines for you. To horse, you gallant princes, straight to horse. Do but behold yon poor and starved band, and show your f- and your fair show shall suck away their souls, leaving them but the shales and husks of men. There is not work enough for all our hands, scarce blood enough in all their sickly veins to give each naked curtail curtail axe a stain that our French gallants shall draw up to shall today draw out and sheathe for lack of sport. Let us but blow on them, the vapor of our valor will o'erturn them. Tis positive against all exceptions, lords, that our superfluous lackeys and our peasants, who in none necessary action swarm about our squares of battle, were enough to purge this field of such a hildling foe. Though we upon this mountain's base by took stand for idle expeculation, but that our honors must not. What's to say? A very little, little, let us do all. A very little, little, let us do, and all is done. Then let the trumpet sound, the tucket saunts, and the note to mount, for our approach shall shall so much dare the field that England shall crouch down in fear and yield. And then we scroll down and we listen to Grand Pair, Grand Pre, Grand Pre. Yond island carrions, desperate for their bones, ill favoredly become the morning field. Their ragged curtains poorly are let loose, and our air shakes them passing scornfully. Big Mars seems bankrupt in their beggared host, and faintly. Through a rusty beaver peeps, the horsemen sit like fixed candlesticks, with torch staves in their hand, and their poor jades lob down their heads, dropping their hides and hips, the gum down roping from their pale dead eyes, and in their pale dull mouths, the gemmeled bit lies foul with chawed grass still and motionless, and their executors, the knavish crows, fly o'er them all, impatient for their hour. Description cannot suit itself in words to demonstrate the life of such a battle in life so lifeless as it shows itself. Okay. I believe their ragged curtains are their flags. I'm not quite sure what the flags are called. Eh, I'll just call it a flag. Very good, Miss Vickers. Find a direct quote that best supports your supposition. Hmm. Find a direct quote that best supports your supposition.
very good. All right. I just have it up there. Thank you, sweetheart. All right, we are now going to move on to scene two. Nope, scene three. Sorry, now there's a whack of questions. Let me just look at them all. According to the notes for lines seven to ten, Salisbury's line foreshadows an upcoming event. Can you guess what this might be? And since there are notes on the side of the page, we're definitely going to look at that. What does Westmoreland say to ignite Henry V's passionate St. Crispin's Day speech? This is the biggest, again, there's so many famous scenes and speeches in this play. Um, and St. Crispin's. Yes, please. Um, yes, please. Go over Henry's speech to his men. How does he inspire his men to fight? Select the most poignant phrase that you feel stirs courage into the hearts of Henry's men. Would these lines work on you to fight for this king? Why or why not? Why does, king, why does Henry emphasize the fact that this day is St. Crispin's? Consider the symbolic element. How does the king respond to Montjoy's message from the constable of France? Remember, Montjoy is the herald. What is the only ransom the king is willing to give the French? Now, of course, this is um, the same response he has given before. So if you've been keeping up with the play, one might assume you already know the answer to that question. How, according to King Henry V, will the English dead wreak havoc on the French a second time? I'm going to assign question number three. Scene three, the English camp. Enter Gloucester, Bedford, Exeter, Empringham with all his host, Salisbury and Westmoreland. Where is the king? The king himself is rode to view their battle. Of fighting men, they have full three score thousand. There's five to one. Besides, they are all fresh. They all are fresh. God's arms strike with us. Tis a fearful odds. God be with you, princes all. All to my charge. If we no more meet till we meet in heaven, then joyfully, my noble Lord of Bedford, my dear Lord Gloucester, and my good Lord Exeter, and to my kind kinsmen, warriors all adieu. Ah, what are these lines foreshadowing? Now, bearing in mind they have a full three score thousand, full three score meanings, three times 20, so 60,000 men versus their 10,000, because the odds are five to one. So the knowledge that if they no more meet till we meet in heaven, that some of them will die, and that the lines come from Salisbury. It's a dramatic technique foreshadowing that he himself will die. Farewell, good Salisbury. And good luck go with thee. Farewell, kind lord. Fight valiantly today. And yet I do thee wrong to mind thee of it, for thou art framed of the firm truth of valor. Exit Salisbury. He is as full of valors as of kindness, princely in both. This is a build-up so that the audience can feel the way to Salisbury's death later on. Otherwise, there's no need to take this much time to talk about him. Enter King Henry. Oh, that we now had here but one ten thousand of those men in England that do no work today. This is how these are the lines that inspire St. Crispin's Day speech. What's he that wishes so? My cousin Westmoreland? No, 
my fair cousin. If we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. By Jove, I am not covetous for gold, nor care I who doth feed upon my cost. It yearns me not if men my garments wear. Such outward things dwell not in my desires. But if it be a sin to covet honor, I am the most offending soul alive. No, faith, my cuz, wish not a man from England God's peace. I would not lose so great an honor as one man more, methinks, would share from me. For the best hope I have. Oh, do not wish one more. Rather proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host, that he which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made and crowns for convoy put into his purse. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when the day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall see this day and live old age will yearly on the vi vigil festal feast his neighbors and say, Tomorrow is St. Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, These wounds I had on Crispin's day. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry, the king, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups, freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few. We happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile. This day shall gentle his condition, and gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap, whilst any speak that fought with us upon St. Crispian's day. Enter Salisbury. My sovereign lord, bestow yourself with speed. The French are bravely in their battles set, and will with all expedience charge on us. All things are ready, if our minds be so. Perish the man who is perish the man whose mind is backward now. Thou dost not wish more help from England, cuz? God's will, my liege, would you and I alone, without more help, could fight this royal battle. Why, now thou hast unwished five thousand men, which likes me better than to wish us one. You know your places. God be with you all. Tuck it. Enter Montjoy. Once more I come to know of thee, King Henry, if for thy ransom thou wilt now compound before thy most assured overthrow. For certainly thou art so near the gulf, for certainly thou art so near the gulf, thou needs must be englutted. Besides, in mercy, the constable desires thee, thou wilt mind thy followers of repentance, that their souls may make a peaceful and a sweet retire from off these fields where wretches, their poor bodies, must lie and fester. Who has sent thee now? The constable of France. I pray thee, I pray thee, bear my former answer back. Bid them achieve me and then sell my bones. Good God, why should they mock poor fellows thus? 
The man that once did sell the lion's skin while the beast lived was killed with hunting him. A many of our bodies shall no doubt find native graves upon the which I trust shall witness live in brass of this day's work. And those that leave their valiant bones in France, dying like men, though buried in your dung hills, they shall be famed, for there the sun shall greet them and draw their honors reeking up to heaven, leaving their earthly parts to choke your clime. The smell whereof shall breed a plague in France. Mark then abounding in valor in our English, that being dead, like to the bullets creasing, break out into a second curse of mischief, killing and relapse of mortality. Let me speak proudly, tell the constable, we are but warriors for the working day. Our gainness and our guilt are all besmirched with rainy marching in the painful field. There is not a piece of feather in our host, good argument, I hope, we will not fly, and time hath worn us into slovenry. But by the mass, our hearts are in the trim. And my poor soldiers tell me, yet ere night, they'll be in fresher robes, or they will pluck the gay new coats or the French soldiers' heads and turn them out in service. <coughs> Excuse me, my throat went dry in the middle of the speech. <coughs> if they do this, as if God please they shall, my ransom then will soon be levied. Herald, save thou thy labor. Come thou no more for ransom, gentle herald. They shall have none, I swear but these my joints, which if they have, as I will leave them, shall yield them little. Tell them, tell the constable. So I shall, King Henry, and so fare thee well. Thou shalt never hear Harold any more. <laughs> I fear thou wilt once more come again for a ransom. Enter York. My lord, most humbly on my knee, I beg the leading of the Bay Ward. Take it, brave York. Now, soldiers, march away, and how thou pleasest, God dispose the day. Exit. So, I'm going to get you to focus on, to begin, St. Crispian's speech. In fact, and here it is, in the notes on the side of the page, we have three versions of this famous speech. So, while you were thinking of, hi, Mr. Mala Llewellyn, question number three. I'm going to remind us all of question number three. <clears throat> I'm going to play you each of these three versions. <laughs> ah, that's not what I wanted. That works now. For the purpose of our discussion, we don't need this last one, but you do need to respond to it in your answer. So let's go back and find those three versions. with it. Nope. About this one. Nope. The one on St. Crispin's. <laughs> I 
There we go. So we have three versions. We'll go from the oldest to the newest, which means I'll start with um, Sir Lawrence Olivier, <laughs> followed by Kenneth Branagh, followed by and it will be followed by, it will be followed by Tom Hiddleston. <laughs> so, starting with Sir Lawrence Olivier. Do not work today. What's he that wishes so? My cousin Westmoreland? No, my fair cousin. If we are not to die, we are enough to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. Rather proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host, that he which hath no stomach to this feast, let him depart. His passport shall be drawn and crowns for convoy put into his purse. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called Feast of Christmas. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him in the name of Christian. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, Tomorrow is St. Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, These wounds I had on him. One men forget, yet all shall be forgot. But he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son. And Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we man of brother. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so base. The gentlemen in England now ahead shall think themselves a curse, they will not hear. They call their backwoods cheap. Oh, there we go. That's that one. Let's get out of here. Scroll up to the next, the closest, not the most modern version, but almost, Kenneth Branagh. Where is the king? The king himself is rode to view their battle. Of fighting men. They have full three score thousand. That's five to one. Besides, they are all fresh. It is a fearful odds. Oh, that we now had here. But one ten thousand of those men in England that do no work today. What's he that wishes so? My cousin Westmoreland. No, my fair cousin. <laughs> We are marked to die. We are enough to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. Rather, proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host, that he which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made, and crowns for convoy put into his purse. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand at tiptoe when this day is named, and arouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall see this day and live old age will yearly on the vigil 
feast his neighbors and say, tomorrow is St. Crispin's. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispin's day. Old men forget. Dead all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Mention our names, familiar in their mouths as household words. Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world. But we in it shall be remembered. We few. We happy few. We band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England, now are bed, shall think themselves a curse they were not here. And hold down manhood's cheek, while any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day! <laughs> My sovereign lord, bestow yourself with speed. The French are bravely in their battle set, and will with all expedient march upon us. All things are ready if our minds be so. Finish the man whose mind is backward now. Thou dost not wish more help from England, cuz? God's will, my liege. Would you and I alone, without more help, can fight this royal battle? <laughs> you know your places. God be with you all. We don't need to watch Mont Joy. Once more I come to know, be King Harry, if for thy ransom thou wilt now compound before thy most assured overthrow. Wait a minute. Let's get back. Emily strip his sleeve and show his scars and say these wounds I have. This story should have been mad teaching. Old man! Man, stop! Man. Son. And Crispin Crispian shall. Here we go. Weird when you have two films happening at the same time. This story shall the good man teach his son. And Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world. We in it shall be remembered. We few. We happy few. We band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves a curse they were not here. And hold their manhoods cheap. While well, as any speaks that fought with us. Upon St. Crispin's day. My sovereign lord. Bestow yourself with speed. The French are bravely in their battle set. And will with all expedients charge on us. All things are ready if our minds be so. Perish the man whose mind is backward now. Thou dost not wish more help from England, cuz? God's will, my liege. Would you and I alone, without more help, could fight this royal battle? <laughs> Why now thou hast unwished five thousand men, which likes me better than to wish us one. You know your places. God be with you all. My lord. 
most humbly on my knee I beg the leading of the Valid. So there we go. Let's get us back into Act 5. So, let's look at our question. You've had three different versions. Yeah! So you have chosen a really poignant phrase. What about this? What about these lines make them so inspiring? So now how do you explain that? It is, I, I agree with you, one of the most poignant phrases. What makes them so inspiring? What is it about them? What exactly, in your own words, is he saying? And why would that inspire them? Nice. The king also tells the men, all his men, that they are his equals, even the lowest man is brought up high with his king by fighting by his side this day. Not just the lords, sure that's correct grammar before I post it. I'm actually quite pleased with that line. So what I'm doing with what Miss Vickers has said is trying to extend it to show you how to take your concepts, your understanding, and take it to the next level. You found the good quote, you provided a good rationale, now one step further. Because that one step further takes you out of the satisfactory proficient range and throws you into the excellent. Well, well, well. I can leave it as is. Whee! Happy, happy. Wee, happy few. We few. We band of brothers. For you who are with me here today in class. <laughs> How to bastardize Shakespeare. Alrighty. So, we have time. Yay. We are going to now read scene three. Nope, we did scenes two and three. We're going to read scene four. 
There we go. How does Pistol prove himself to be the kind of soldier claimed of him in Act 3, Scene 6? And <clears throat> let me just remind you of those lines, because I've got them in my Act 5 questions. Here we go. I'm going to give you that as well. Here. Pistol really proves himself. Why, tis a gull, a fool, a rogue, that now and then goes to the wars to grace himself at his return to, into London under the form of a soldier. And such fellows are perfect in the great commander's names, and they will learn you by rote where services were done at such and such a sconce, at such a breach, at such a convoy, who came off bravely, who was shot, who disgraced, what the terms the enemy stood on, and this they con perfectly in the phrase of war, which they trick up with new turned oaths, and what a beard of the general's cut and a horrid suit of the camp will do among foaming bottles and ale-washed wits is wonderful to be thought on. So, um, that's probably not the best set of lines. I'm going to erase them, but they do tell us that he is definitely going out there and going to bring back the spoils of war. I will leave them in there. Why is it not necessary for the audience to understand French in order to follow the dialogue and direction of this scene? Where does the boy say he plans to go at the end of the scene? As you were asked to read the play in advance, what does this foreshadow? And which line best predicts this upcoming event? Alrighty. Scene four, the field of battle. Alarm, excursions, enter pistol, French soldier, and boy. Yield, cur. Je pense que vous êtes gentilhomme de bon qualité. Quality, calamity, cast your me. Art thou a gentleman? What is thy name? Discuss. Au oh, seigneur Dieu. Au oh, seigneur Dieu should be a gentleman. Perpend my words. O oh, seigneur Dieu. And mark. O oh, seigneur Dieu. Thou diest on point of fox. Except. O oh, seigneur. Thou do give me egregious ransom. Oh, prenez, Miss Corday, et pitié de moi. Moi shall not serve. I will have forty mois, or I will fetch thy rim out of thy throat in drops of crimson blood. It is impossible de chaper de la force de ton bras. Brask her? Thou damned and luxurious mountain goat, offerest me brass? Oh, pardonnez-moi. Sayest thou me so? Is that a ton of moas? Come hither, boy. Ask me this slave in French. What is his name? Écoutez, comment êtes-vous appelé? Monsieur le Feu. He says his name is Master Fur. Master Fur. I'll fur him and furk him and ferret him. Discuss the same in French unto him. I do not know the French for fur and ferret and furk. Bid him prepare, for I will cut his throat. To the boy, Qui dit il, monsieur? Il me commande à vous dire qui vous faites vous prêt, car ce soldat ici est disposé tout à cette heure de couper votre gorge. Oi! Coupal, gorgé, permafoy, peasant, unless thou gives me crowns, brave crowns or mangled, shalt thou be by this my sword. Oh, je vous supplie, pour l'amour de Dieu, me pardonnez, je suis gentle homme de bon maçon, gardez ma vie, et je vous donnerai de saint écus. <coughs> <coughs> Simon, are you upstairs? <coughs> yeah. 
I really need a little bit of water. I'm so sorry to bother you. I know. What are his words? He prays you to save his life. He is a gentleman of a good house, and for his ransom, he will give you 200 crowns. <laughs> Tell him my fury shall abate, and I the crowns will take. Petit monsieur, qu'il dit il? Encore, qu'il est contre son jurement de pardonner à qu'un prisonnier n'amende pour les excuses qui vous lui avez promis. Il est content à vous donner la liberté, le franchissement. <coughs> Ce mes genoux, je vous donne mille merci et je m'estime heureux qui j'aille tomber être les mains d'un chevalier. Je pense et le brave Villian, I give you my feet, but I'm teaching. Et très distingué, Seigneur d'Angleterre. And I apologize for my destroying the French language. Expound unto me, boy. He gives you upon his knees a thousand thanks, and he esteems himself happy that he has fallen into the hands of one as he thinks the most brave, valorous, and thrice worthy Seigneur of England. As I suck blood, I will some mercy show. Follow me. Suivez-vous le grand capitaine. Exit pistol and the French soldier. I did never know so vo a voice. I did never know so full a voice issue from so empty a heart. But the saying is true. The empty vessel makes the greatest sound. Bardolph and Nim had ten times more valor than this roaring devil in the old play, that everyone must pare his nails with a wooden dagger, and they are both hanged. And so this would be if he durst steal anything adventurously. I must stay with the lackeys with the luggage of our camp. The French must have a good prey of us if he knew of it, for there is none to guard it but boys. Exit. <laughs> So, scrolling back up, even though we don't know French, who can tell me what the um, conversation, you know, what was their conversation? Even though we don't know French. And it actually doesn't matter. And I'm not asking you to rewrite the whole dialogue. Just, you know, in one or two sentences, tell me what they converse, what their conversation was about. So think in terms of 
What does Pistol want? Ah. ah very good, Mr. Malawan. Mr. Malaluan. Now the the boy with the boy's help. With the boy's help, what is the capital F? See, taking barely a millisecond more, and I avoid that same overall boo-boo. <laughs> oh, crap. Guess who forgot proper punctuation? <laughs> I got all that trouble to fix the word French, and I screw up with punctuation. So with the boy's help, what is the French soldier's response? You can even go so far as to tell me how much money he agrees to give him. He doesn't offer him brass. But he does offer him. You are correct. Oh my God, 200. Again, the value of taking a millisecond just to proofread. So this whole incident helps to evidence that Gower is correct in his, in his assessment of Pistol as being a rasp scallion somebody who's only in the wars to benefit financially and to take home great stories. And this is a great story he can tell. I took a French soldier prisoner and he also gets the ransom of 200 crowns. A fair amount of money to take home with him. Now let's look at the last part of this scene. I think it's important. Um, we learn that Nim goes the same way as Bardolph and that they are both hanged. But we also learn that we also get a foreshadowing. Where does the boy say he is going to go? And what future incident are we told about later on in the play? Thank <laughs> you.
you really only have two sentences to read and interpret. <clears throat> Where is the boy going? So it's like a little transition. Just a way to end the scene. While I'm off, I'm going to go to blank. Well, you guys are figuring that out. I'm going to do a quick snapshot. Oh, yay! Mr. Liggett! Liggett! Welcome back! I have four students today. That's amazing. Yes, it has. So, the lines. Just before the boy exits, he says, I must stay with the lackeys, with the luggage of our camp. The French might have a good prey of us if he knew of it, for there's none to guard it but boys. So where's the boy going? And what event does it foreshadow? And it's event we only get in exposition. I think I gave you the definition for lackeys before. Very good. What is that foreshadow? And that, of course, is our what is likeliest to happen based on that last sentence. <laughs>
So we know that the boy, one of the four, actually I don't need this, who joined the war with Bardolph Moon and Pistol, will die. And of the four, Oh, before he had the most morals, he had the best morals. Okay, there we go. Act four, scenes two, three, and four. Tomorrow, scenes five and six. Monday, scenes seven and eight. Tuesday, act five. Prologue, scene one. We might finish. Act 5 by Tuesday or Wednesday next week. Act 5 only has two scenes in it. Like Act 1, it's very short. It has a prologue and an epilogue. Though the course comes in, gives its prologue. We get to see the last of the the um, finalizing of the... Not the finalizing. What is that called? The falling action. The tying together of all the loose ends. And the conclusion. Um, and then an epilogue where the chorus makes, has the last say. All right, before we sign off, does anyone have any questions? I'm not getting any response, so I'm going to assume that means no questions. So I'm going to stop recording.